Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, this talking head that has been in your ear now for the last 90 seconds or so. My name is Dean Chandler, and I want to uh, thank you uh, for joining us on what is going to be first of many webinars and live events and discussions, we hope, um, that are in the, uh, the Viewpoint TVP quiver. This is TVP Talks, um, breaking into CTV OTT monetization. Um, we wanted to do a collective of these things because uh, it is the wild west out there in the CTV OTT space and a lot of things haven't been resolved or some have been resolved incorrectly or they're just more than one way to do things. And here we're gonna um, try to focus as much as we can on monetization, monetization platforms, how to get started in revenue um, as you break into this space. Um, and so with that, uh, it would behoove us to bring in some experts who have done just that. And in front of you, there are uh, three uh, experts in this space and I'll, um, I'll start by uh, introducing them. But first, my name is Dean Chandler. I am head of business development here in North America for The Viewpoint. Um, anecdotally, it's TVP, um, and we are a SaaS-based uh, monetization and uh, monetization partner and platform for publishers. We try to and we succeed in optimizing the revenue uh, monthly uh, and the CPMs for our publishers via our SaaS-based business model, instead of um, depending on things like revenue share. We've built this uh, platform, TVP, specifically for the OTT CTV space and the unique challenges that come with um, getting involved in this. There is not a lot of uh, legacy from desktop and mobile um, programmatic uh, elements in our, in, in our platform. It's specifically built to uh, optimize those of you that are brave enough to take this step into the, T the CTV OTT fast space. Maybe by next week, there'll be another uh, Anagram for this, but right now we'll stick with those three. And um, to get us moving, uh, we've, like I said, brought in three experts to help us. And so let me make some introductions here. Uh, the gentleman right there, Casey McLeod, is the Vice President of Biz Business Development at Video Elephant. Before joining Video Elephant, Casey worked uh, in the uh, in business development at Mike, the millennial news media organization and company. And then before that, Vivo, the world's largest premium music and video entertainment platform, of which I am a fan. Um, prior to that, uh, Casey decided to break off a big chunk of CEO ship and uh, took on Vire Films, a streaming service that brought the best international independent films to the U.S. for the first time. Alongside uh, Casey is Anna Koicheva, who is the strategic partnership and communications advisor at Vlogbox, one of the largest OTT CTV platforms out there. Uh, within just eight years, Anna has built a large number of successful marketing communication strategies to help companies stand out in the competitive advertising marketing technologies landscape. And aside, uh, Anna is Aaron Bendich. She is the director of advertising and digital media rights um, where he manages the entire advertising monetization business, which seems like a heavy lift from technical integrations to client relations to sales. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the hour here, a few housekeeping items. After the webinar, we'll, have, we'll go through some audience questions. If you have them, please add them to the comment section. Um, we are recording this uh, webinar. So if you don't want your boss to know where you are, please uh, change your name. Um, and you'll be able to uh, view this and dig back into all of the um, helpful nuggets we'll provide at any given time. And then finally, please just uh, hold your applause to all the profound statements we will be making uh, until the end of the webinar. Uh, and with that, let's start it off. And I'm gonna start off with a hardball. Um, so it, it's gonna be a two-parter because I think context is important in order to know where you are, where you're going, kind of got to know where you're, you've come from. So I'm going to open this up and I will just uh, pick a name out of the hat and then we'll go around the table, you know, metaphorically speaking. Um, uh, Casey, uh, when and how did your organization decide to blaze trails into the CTV OTT wilderness? And then I will, after that, give you a follow-up with about monetization, but please go ahead. 
Sure. Um, I mean, first off, Dean, thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me to participate. Very happy to be joining um, this group of experts, and I'm excited to, to learn some things as well. Um, but Video Elephant's uh, introduction into or entry into the CTV, o uh, CTV OTT space um, it happened a few years ago. Uh, I joined the company back in 2017, and even at that time, we were already starting to do work um, with the fast channels that really weren't called that at the time. Um, for some context, Video Elephant, we're a premium short form video aggregator, which essentially means we're a simple two-sided content marketplace. A lot of content comes in. Uh, we built up a library of over 2 million videos. We had about 2,500 new pieces of content a day across pretty much every vertical. Uh, and then with that giant library, we turn around and make it available to basically anyone who has a need for content. Um, so, <clears throat> pardon me. So um, we were already seeing these different channels and apps that were searching to supplement their in-house content offering, and we were able to do direct licensing deals to them. Now, the ecosystem there has obviously evolved a lot uh, in the past couple of years, but really, I would say, you know, I'm thinking Demexco 2019 was the time when it's just like every mm. conversation you were having was around, have you seen the CPMs in the OTT space? Um, and, and is there content that's available there? So I think that um, that was when we really started saying, okay, is there more that we can do here? Um, and what can we do to build out that, that functionality that best addresses the ecosystem? And that meant, of course, you know, building up our content library for that, but then also what are the, the products uh, that can best align with the, the revenue that's out there to hopefully capture? Fantastic. So what does that sort of, what did that model look like for you guys? Um, I'm familiar with uh, Video Elephant for some time, fantastic company. So um, it's, w once you sort of got here, once you um, sort of, once you're having those, the Mexico conversations, what was it, is it a combination of things? Did you, what was your monetization strategy? Create an SVOD, build a, build and program apps with content, license content, what sort of, what did you settle on for lack of a better term? Sure. Um, you know, I think in short, um, we never really settled on anything. Um, or, <laughs> right, or no, there's no, that. right. Um, and what does that speak to you exactly? Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, for, I think we always knew it was going to be AVOD. Um, we recognize that our content library strength is uh, scale and diversity uh, and less so exclusivity um, or premier content. And I think that you know, sort of SVOD leans towards the latter and AVOD leans towards the former. Um, I guess kind of that uh, fidelity versus accessibility, you know, balance. Um, but what it allowed us to do once we recognized we wanted to be in that space is we had solved, I think, probably one of the more difficult parts of, of having something, you know, whatever, whatever it may be in the OTT space, which was the content existed. Um, so we then kind of embarked on a series of experiments in, you know, where do we truly fit in this ecosystem? So we built a consumer facing app, um, which was the first time there was ever sort of a direct consumer offering from Video Elephant. Historically, we'd always been a B2B uh, service. Right. We, that evolved into spinning off the component parts of that consumer facing service to recognize, okay, how can actually the tech we, we built and the systems we put in place here better uh, suit those apps and platforms that have already built audience okay, now that we're working, empowering, you know, components of other people's services, what are the feature sets we need to build out around monetization for that? Right. And, you know, the evolution continues. Um, I think that Video Wealth has always been a very a company that prides itself on flexibility. Uh, we use the word agnostic a lot. Um, and I think that that's something we're sort of embracing when it comes to our work in the OTT CTV space, which is you know, let's kind of have a conversation about what everyone's goals are and we'll figure out how, you know, what we're doing can align with that. And if it doesn't, you know, what can we do so that we can be in that space? So there was a bit big of an answer, but that's kind of what our, our the past year has been for us in, in terms of our settling on uh, strategy. Uh, no, that was delicious. That, um, and there should be a bumper sticker about the CTV OTC space. The evolution continues. Mm -hmm. um, um, Aaron, same two parts to you, but uh, I'll remind you of what they are. Um, just uh, when and how, you know, did uh, DMR, digital media rights, sort of get into this space and sort of the evolution, um, where you can hit the narrative points of getting into the CTV OTT wilderness and sort of what drove that? Yeah, so uh, we got our start about 11 years ago now uh, with the content 
uh, rights aggregation side, uh, aggregating rights for primarily East Asian, Southeast Asian films. And uh, a few years into that process, we had enough streaming rights to, to break into this uh, OTT publishing side of things. Coming out of the um, third party type distribution to platforms like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and actually putting together a branded product that could live on these uh, OTT platforms like uh, Roku and the smart TVs, et cetera. Um, and uh, we started with our Asian, our Asian vertical with one application and broke into some additional uh, uh, for specific verticals, uh, not just cramming everything into one sort of uh, space where we'd have a lopsided slant towards uh, one genre versus another. Instead, we, we, we did the sort of sc more scattered approach, uh, making different uh, interrelated with some overlapping content, but uh, yeah, separate, separate applications. Right. And then, um, so to the monetization strategy, right? It, um, the answer is in what you just said, sort of, but if you could just sort of elaborate, so, um, how, does, how does the monetization work? What are you guys, um, uh, working, is the revenue from advertisers, is it licensing? Is it a combination of those things? Is it? Yeah, so for our OTT publishing side of our business, which is just one part of our multi-pronged uh, right. business strategy, it, um, we, we do uh, um, advertising backing for, for um, our applications, but um, a lot of viewers like to have the option to uh, opt out of advertising by, by paying a subscription. So we've got that hybrid model um, where we're not, we're not really putting a lot of content behind a paywall but we're giving users the option to, um, to opt out by, by buying in uh, with right. subscription. And, uh, you know, conventional, like, uh, sort of logic would, would, would lead you to think that that would perhaps detract from our, our growth in our advertising side. But in fact, it, it, it doesn't. It, it's, a, it's, it's just a, it keeps you. It allows us to keep the users who would opt out um, because they don't like the advertising experience, and allows us mm -hmm. to keep growing the um, the user base uh, in both sides. Uh, and we've experimented with both, and it's 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 been interesting to see that the um, you know how that monetization strategy has played out in our favor. Right. It's just so great. You can ask this question different times, and you get great different answers. It just that's. I think that's why we're all drawn to this space is that it's 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 sort of we're making not making it up as we go but we're but nimble is an attract is an attractive quality um and a same question to you uh, uh vlog box is just a, a powerhouse and i just want to uh allow you to um sort of discuss how you guys have how you guys got into the ott ctv space for a second if you could Sure, sure. So actually, uh, I believe the year we started, uh, like officially, uh, was 2019. But uh, how how it came to as an idea and eventually as a business, is that we had this discussion with the team actually who are the founders now, and uh, um, we had clients who are the, on the web and uh, on social media, and who are uh, saying that they have these YouTube channels and they are like really high quality, really interesting and engaging, and they had like millions of uh, you know subscribers and all that stuff but they wouldn't earn a lot and uh, we actually you know started looking at what are the other options and you can't you know just simply stream your high quality content on like any social media or any web uh, developing uh, you know another just another one um, web hub for for your video content doesn't work and the ctv came up like right on time um, mm -hmm. And so we've decided that it should be fair enough to, you know, to give the opportunity to those content creators to actually to have the chance to uh, to get their first of all their deserved, you know, channels and applications right. on CTV and at the same time to to earn money from that. Uh, and it was, I mean, in the beginning, definitely it was a struggle because at that time. CTV was still kind of new and really complicated with all those things and with development side, especially with some of the 
uh, you know, software to find the right developers was really complicated because many of the languages are not simply popular. Uh, yeah. But that was a challenge and probably for a year or something. But the time I really, you know, realized that this is not just a business, but kind of a mission is then uh, I found a YouTube channel. It was, it had like probably 10 million uh, subscribers. Um, it was really interesting. It was scientific. Uh, the quality of the content was just like unbelievable. It was like something, you know, from BBC or some, some, some sort right. of a channel. Uh, and I decided definitely I shall give a try and reach out to the guys. Pro I was assuming that they probably already have their channel on CTV and so forth. Uh, but the, you know, the results surprised me a lot because I found out that they shut down because they couldn't, you know, make, uh, they, they didn't have profits. Uh, they right. wouldn't put so much money into the development of the content. Uh, and YouTube would cut so much of the profits that would simply, you know, couldn't survive. Uh, so at that moment, it was, I believe, like two years ago, something we realized definitely we're on the you know, right path. So uh, we moved forward. It was a, a little bit you know, of a struggle in the beginning, but definitely uh, starting from early last year, we, we, you know, we moved significantly forward and we saw uh, the, you know, the, the eventual outcome we'd love to see that people uh, and content developers who have their really high quality quant content can now find, you know, finally get their unique independent, uh, really independent channels and receive money from them and focus on their development of the content instead of you know, thinking of the different strategies, how to monetize it, how to find the, you know, their audiences and all that kind of things. Right. That is, and that's super interesting. And you bring up sort of a great point that there is an opportunity there to create, um, we, all three of you described fairly different, but aligned paths. There's, there's content licensing and distribution, there's content creation and, and, and channel distribution. And there's, there's this opportunity at, at, at places like Blogbox where you can create an app channel with a monetization platform um, in yeah. mind and, and go out and, and with these independent um, creators. The thing that is interesting is where there's this narrative thread um, between all of you. Um, DMR is actually more feature film, but there's, a lot, there's, there's this migration, if you will, from web monetization to OTT CTV monetization, which then brings the challenge of under what bucket does this does the revenue fall when you're going out to get uh, revenue for those when you're going to the agencies and the DSPs and things like that. Um, when uh, speaking of revenue, because um, you know that's pretty important. Uh, when you guys so finding a partner or a platform is sort of key, um, and I know not everyone here is specifically dedicated into the bucket of of, of of monetization through advertising, but I'd love to, and we'll go back to the top of the batting order uh, with you, Casey. Um, you know, when when you're talking about uh, monetization and revenue, uh, what was sort of some of the criteria you're looking at for the right platform monetization partner? Sure, um, you know, it's a really important question and it was for us because historically, uh, since its inception, uh, going back to that idea of us being agnostic, you know, we've always said video elephant is monetization agnostic. We've, we've always, you know, pushed content to our, our partners or clients uh, and let them sort it out, you know, what makes the most sense for them. So uh, when it became time for us to think about how we're going to be monetizing, um, you know, I think that ultimately what makes the most sense when you're starting off. And, and I think also for us with this idea of, you know, recognizing it's going to be an evolution um, is actually like relationship almost over you know, other considerations like demand sources or tech stack. Um, because, you know, there's going to be this kind of trial and error process as we figure out what is best for us and, and, and how we're going to work. And these things are new and, and you know, knowing that the other side is willing to you know be a meaningful partner and like actually like contribute advice or suggestions or walk you through probably some really like facile concepts um, right. is is really helpful. And I, I think it's kind of analogous to like they say you know the the actor who's starting off in their career. Like you don't want the superstar agent because like they don't care about your career. You want like the person right. who like 
cares about you enough that they they want to see you succeed instead of just your your one of of a massive portfolio and i think that's been really beneficial to us i think that of course then once you do become like hulu that's the place where optimizing 1% has this massively uh, impactful uh, revenue uh, or is massively impactful from a revenue perspective. Whereas for us, it's really about that kind of zero to one nuts and bolts, like everything needs to work stage. And, and that's where I think kind of the more person to person relationship kind of, you know, takes precedent. Right. Um, I'm going to mix it up and go to Anna. Same question. So, um, you know, buying uh, you know, what kind of criteria are you guys looking for when you want to monetize blog box content and the blogs bo- blog box channels? Uh, well, actually, from some point, we're also a monetization platform. And so, sure. here, yeah, so here we definitely, you know, we try to uh, meet the same, the same, you know, criteria and our partners as we try to provide for our clients. So, I mean, for our partners. It all trickles down, right? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, I absolutely agree, uh, just simply agree with what just Casey said. It's so important that, uh, you know, the platform actually shares the same viewpoint, uh, the same, uh, uh, the viewpoint, yeah, the same viewpoint and the same objective uh, you put uh, in in front of yourself. Um, It's highly important that, you know, the people actually, uh, the managers you have, uh, they look for the right advertisers, especially with the content we work. We have really uh, segmented content. Yeah. So we have kids content and kids programs. We have uh, lots of, let's say, fitness and so forth. And obviously when our publishers um, and our advertisers, yeah, first of all, I mean, our, our partners and our monetization platforms, they, then they think about the engagement, about the the financial end user, the, fi- the I mean, the final end user, I'm sorry, uh, the final, you know, consumer, which is the audience and what they will see, what they will consume from their TV is definitely is highly important because uh, we not just care about, you know, the amount of the ads or amount of the, um, uh, I mean, the, the amount of the uh, eventual yields we receive from that, but we also care about, you know, the long-term a strategy that people stay with the content they see and they stay with the channels they, they adore and that the ads uh, are beneficial to them too. And they can actually, you know, go and purchase the right products they'd love to have uh, and, uh, uh, you know, go through their story as well. So it's highly important to have an aligned strategy here. So I believe right. this is kind of the key thing here. Right. Um- but yeah, and that speaks a little bit what Casey said, sort of a partner in it. Um, Aaron, uh, Casey mentioned, um, you know, Hulu. You have a lot, of, you probably have some uh, Hulu. You mentioned Netflix and a few others as some of your content deals. You're probably over there lighting cigars with $100 bills. Um, but uh, no, but the um, sort of the, the same question to you, the, you know, uh, how do you, what are the keys for uh, key criteria for partner? partners and monetization partners? Uh, yeah, um, well, there, there's so many different types of partners that we work with. You know, there's like exactly. the level, broad, all-encompassing uh, technological partners through whom all of our advertising monetization runs through. And then there's folks like uh, SSPs or um, just demand sources. Uh, there's a whole chain of, of, of people we end up working with. And I, I think the most, um, you know, successful partnerships um, a lot of what Casey said rings true. It's a, it, there's a lot in the sort of communication, the mutual understanding, willingness to, to help understand concepts that one party might not um, be totally up on, uh, where the other one might. You know, there, um, there's so much that's changing all the time, even just in the last year and a half with the changing of privacy laws, new, uh, you know, cookies going away, iOS uh, implementing new uh, technological uh, hurdles that you have to cross to, to, to properly monetize. And, and we benefit from having strong relationships with um, monetization partners or platform partners who are able to work closely with us through the process. They see value in our, in our products. They see value in the content we are monetizing. Um, they advocate for us in their, um, in their sales efforts. They uh, even just the simple, uh, you know, process of having a regular phone call, regular email communications where things right. remain consistent. Um, and that of course has to come with 
some success in your monetization relationship with them. But um, you know, it takes it takes a sort of confluence of a few different um, of these key aspects to the relationship to really uh, have us settle into a relationship with a given uh, platform or monetization partner, of which, of course, we're maintaining many, many different key relationships in, in our monetization right. strategy. But there's a, that, there, those are a lot of plates spinning, right? So you have to rely on those partners to sort of guide you because you're not focused on one thing at any given time, right? There's four different pipes coming in and you have to sort of have them remind you of be helpful and partner with you on this strategy that is going to be best for you, right? Across the board. Absolutely. Um, so uh, just a couple of, uh, so when it comes to just the OTT CTV ad part of it, and this is, this is, this is a quick hit one. Do you guys, and, and we'll start with you, uh, direct partnerships, programmatic, both, and then what would be the ratio of between direct uh, advertising partnerships and programmatic deals? Uh, did you get to to me? Pardon me. Yes. Okay. Um, if you want it. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so actually, you know, the thing, if, I mean, uh, who we're approaching to, if, uh, there is just like someone who, who is starting, uh, it's probably really hard to, to get those, you know, uh, really high level direct partnerships. So obviously sure. the strategy to here could be probably, you know, starting from uh, programmatic deals, uh, you know, and then growing, growing, growing with, you know, with the development of the audience and uh, with the development of the quality of the, I mean, of the audience, obviously you may have a direct uh, partnerships, but eventually um, I believe that, you know, uh, you may have, it's all like, obviously you, you can have a direct partnerships at the same time as the direct deals through programmatic and programmatic helps in many ways uh, to optimize the, uh, the ads you receive to optimize the campaigns to make it real time to, to you know to have higher bids to receive eventually more yields so uh, definitely you know mixing that up with the platform you work with is highly important uh, and seeing what, what actually works best for you and for your content um, we, we mix it we usually mix it but uh, we may see that in some t- in many you know in many in many cases definitely being on the open market and having uh, access to the you know uh, first of all the uh, open uh, you know the open bidding system is really important because uh, it brings much more yield uh, the, the higher the quality right. is definitely you may have direct deals as well so I mean what we do we actually, with the viewpoint here specifically, we found uh, the best way for us, you know, for you to, to find some kind of uh, um, best sales representatives who, who would find with the, your um, concierge service, yeah, to find the right, right. advertisers who could eventually, eventually, you know, become the direct partners of ours, but be really on long term and really successful. Thanks, asking. Thank you for that plug. Yes, our DSP yeah. concierge service is... Uh is one of our one of our favorite things and our best go-to markets. It's uh, basically for those that want help being connected to the DSPs that are out there. We go, our whole model is to go above the reseller fray and create curated environments um, from publisher to DSPs and back uh, so that you have your own private marketplace. So thank you for that segue. Um, but same question to you guys, um, Aaron, um, direct partnerships, programmatic and sort of the split there. Um, yeah, I think what Anna said is totally true. Um, you, you can't just jump in and suddenly have a lot of direct partnerships. Of course, they're very high value. Um, you know, it's hard to even compare how much value you can generate from a strong direct partnership versus programmatic sources. But if you had 100% direct, it would be a less stable, uh, less stable demand stack. So you, I, I don't. I that think is a that, great point. That is a great point. Yeah, oh. and I, so I think. It, it's really easy to undervalue having a substantial programmatic demand stack. I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of, of expanding that to whatever limit we can reach, while also, of course, keeping our focus on those key direct relationships, the ones that will have those uh, unbelievably high and impressive CPMs. But you, it, having, having a, a lot of different demand to fall back on is, uh, is, is, uh, just there, 
there's no limit to the to the to the value there because because remember you wanna you wanna have uh you wanna fill your your um your inventory there's no uh there's no way around that I I, I mean you don't you don't want to undervalue your user experience but the the it, it, there there has to be something there to to um to fill right. the break because you're giving away the content that you're licensing for free right. The, uh, as you were describing that sort of value of, of the of the of the stack the, that you can fall back on, the word in my head was comfort, right, or security, something along those lines, right. Um, it's helpful to sort of base it on that. Uh, Casey, uh, same to you. Um, pragmatic, direct, split. Sure. Um, so monetization is is new for us. So we're in that one hundred percent programmatic phase. Um, okay. And, you know, but obviously if, you know, Nike uh, called us, we would uh, take that call. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, I'll be completely transparent. I don't think there's anything I can add beyond what Anna and Aaron have already said, like uh, particularly they're in, in that space, they've seen it firsthand. I can pontificate as an observer, but I think everything they said really like captures it and, and speaks to the importance for, for the balance, the necessity and the importance. Right, and just as a, um, this is, we're gonna be wrapping it up here probably after this one, but um, is it, finding these advertisers is like finding uh, a needle in a stack of broken or empty ad call needles and things like that. But have you guys just uh, sort of anecdotally, um, since you've been in the space, uh, but, but let's just take the last six months just for the heck of it and uh, quarter variance, what it is, are you seeing more demand, uh, more interest in sort of in this in, in the in your CTV OTT offerings? Um, I'm not saying year over year. Well, maybe I am saying year over year, month over month. But um, just as a general sort of flow of things or trend, are you guys seeing um, uh, increase, decrease, flat? And if you guys take any of this. Feel free to jump in first. I may, if you will. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, so obviously, I mean, there are two reasons and two parts of that. The first one, definitely the connected TV market is growing tremendously fast. I mean, it's probably the best, uh, the fastest growing market we can, you know, be uh, to, to, to see in our age. Um, I mean, in a tech. Um, but the second thing is obviously as our channels, as our applications, as our brand grows as well, we may see more interest in our, in, in our, in our audiences, in our inventory eventually. So this is kind of, you know, tab pops first, the, the personal brand, the brand of the company we have, which develops and, you know, brings more attention. And the second one, the CTV market, all those things combined, definitely not just year of the, which is really obvious, but month to month, uh, we, we see more and more engagement and more and more, you know, partnerships and actually um, the bid, you know, the bids are growing as well, which is really, uh, you know, um, promising for us. Right. And so, and I think, um, I was I was going to ask a follow up question about the what what is the most important important metric about campaigns, um, or evaluating campaigns. But if you, it, other than revenue, obviously, um, uh, is it the is bids? Would you say Anna for you? It, it sounded like um, looking at bids is a great. Uh, yeah, CPMs are really important. What is also important is actually uh, the fill rates, which which you know we we, we take uh, seriously. Obviously, hundred percent is probably unachievable at this stage, but definitely um, the you know the growing level of the fill rates is highly important because uh, that means that you know um, uh, we, we we address our audiences correctly. And the same, the, the other thing is also you know the frequency of the ads we we show to to, to the initial consumer because right. we really care of the of the story here. It's important to give the story to tell the story and. Right. Uh, we care here both first of the user, the right. audience, which see that and they see them enough to remember, but not too much to, to hate. Uh, and we care about the advertisers who bring their product or their brand, whether they will, um, to their initial consumer the, without, you know, with, with a really good reputation with the, right. without the same hate. <laughs> right. Um, Aaron, same question to you, lightning round. So. Uh, are you seeing demand pick up and what would be your favorite metric other than the obvious of revenue? Well, um, 
I mean, of course, we're growing. Digital media rights is growing. So with that, we're seeing a growth in our, you know, impression serve. But as far right. as, you know, maybe maybe fill rate or, or uh, would be perhaps a better uh, indicator of that. And I, I think we saw, um, you know, over 2020, uh, there was, of course, a big sort of crash when the pandemic started. Then things took off and went crazy for, for, for like the second half of the year, for us at least. Um, and sustained through Q1. And um, I, we're seeing, you know, with the, once Q2 started, it, there was a, a change, budgets, um, you know, ended or, or modified yep. budgets changed. And, um, you know, I think it's good to be realistic about that and recognize that we had something of a late Q4 or, or, or one might even call it a Q5 <laughs> uh, right. uh, with one 2021 so and, and uh, we're, we're, we're trying to accommodate for that uh, drop off in, you know, with the, with the uh, turnover um, into, into Q2. And, uh, you know, we found ways to take care of that. And we are still seeing an increase in the quality of our demand and the volume of our demand. So ultimately, my answer to your question is, yeah, it's, there is an increase over, over time, a continual increase over, since we've started monetizing. But there, there is that sort of seasonal or quarterly change that happens. And uh, it can be jarring at first, but you get used to it. And, and you have to look at things as, as over four quarters and uh, right. recognize that it's um, you, your best, except during these exceptional pandemic times, your best comparing um, January of one year to January of the previous year. And if there's right. a, if there's Something, if they do, then it's a sign you're succeeding, that you're you're managing your, your monetization uh, effect product uh, changes that you've gone through in that period of time. Perfect, um, Casey. Lighting around you. Same question. Um, interest pickup and uh, and favorite metric or worthwhile metric to evaluate the future. Sure. Sure. Um... Absolutely, seeing an increase of in interest, um, not just in you know the channels that we power ourselves, but you know people looking to utilize our offering for CTV and OTT opportunities. Um, there's definitely something to consider around, you know, in a in a gold rush or anything that you know everyone's talking about like NFTs, right? Everyone sort of rushes into the space, so I think we try to be a bit more um, uh, how. how we try to look at like, what are the, the real opportunities or like the, the long-term ones that, that are going to be around in a year or so. And right. even within that sub subset, uh, there's definitely more uh, taking place. Um, but to, to go along with that, I think, you know, when it comes to our favorite metric, um, I would say it's like consistency um, instead of a CPM or, or a fill rate. Um, I think it's the ability for uh, a partner uh, or us uh, to kind of have some predictability uh, around it. You know, I think that from digital web publishing, we're so biased towards, you know, how close can you get to 100% fill? Um, I think about my time at Vivo, where the demand for music video content is so strong, they could easily have 100% fill, but it's right. a horrible viewing experience. And so they are, they kept it lower than, than that 100% so that actually you could retain your viewers and deliver more impressions. And so if you know you're going to be consistently delivering something, even if it's not 100%, um, I, I think that's kind of the foundation for you know, long-term uh, success. Um, but obviously everything that Aaron and Anna said, you know, are completely, you know, co-sign on, on that as well. Um, well, fantastic. Um, thank you guys for this. Now we're going to turn to the audience. Not everyone rushed to the microphone, aka the Q and A box, all at once. Um, we do. I do see a uh, question um, from Minal B uh, Bagad. Um, his question is to all of you. Uh, you can take it all or not. Um, there are many changes in CTV spends because of Unified 2.0. If you have an opinion panel, uh, what is your opinion your opinion on Unified 2.0, which I believe is basically the deprecation of cookies into uh, sort of the trade desk's new uh, I, uh, user identifier. Any thoughts on that at this point? Casey, because um, you're to my <laughs> the, right. Uh, hot seat. Um, 
All right. Well, because everyone wants like a, a bold opinion in a panel in the Q and A, um, <laughs> what I will say, fire, fire. What, what I will say is, um, I think that there is always going to be a new data product uh, placed or, or data or identification or uh, geo or whatever have you product placed around inventory that will justify a premium CPM. Um, does that ultimately make a difference on buyer behavior? Um, I think that there's a really good Freakonomics epi uh, podcast episode that talks about the efficacy of advertising, one. but I won't spoil it here. Um, so yeah, I mean, sure, more dollars will start going to that product and then someone will introduce something new in Q3 and, and the cycle will, will continue itself. And you know, 20 years, people will say, hey, remember cookies. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's my take on it. I've been in this thing so long that I remember 18 years ago and going, what's a cookie? Um, so uh, does anyone else have a thought on that? Anna, Aaron? Yeah, um, well, just broadly, you know, as standards change, if, if, when, 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 um, when we're asked to adapt to things uh, within reason, um, if it's gonna make the buyers happy, uh, and and you know, hopefully improve the um, like the, the the security and quality of the um, the greater uh, viewing experience in our in our case, but more broadly speaking, the, the um, usage of the internet uh, of connected devices, etc. Right. Um, I think that uh, it's at very least uh, worth um, you know moving for moving forward with the times. There's you know there's plenty of other. As I mentioned before, plenty of other changes that have come in, in, in recent recent times, like the um, you know California uh, privacy law, for CCPA, instance. CCPA, sure. Um, where, and that's another instance of a sort of single but unilateral uh, type of thing. Where one state is sort of determining the entire way that we transact, or, or you know, in, in advertising across the country. Um, but what are we going to do? Not not adapt to that? Right. I think it applies to the, these the. Um, you know, the the changes in cookies, you know, saying goodbye to our old friend. Uh, I, I love the fact that you didn't use the word deprecation of cookies, the changes in cookies, because it's one of those things that I don't, I, have, I think, I think I don't believe that they're necessarily going to go away. Um, so here, uh, here are a couple big ones to chew on. Um, uh, do you, first person has this thought, go ahead and fire off. Do you think AVOD will take over SVOD in the near future? I mean, we're going in that direction. It, it's abundantly clear with all of the linear offerings that are, I mean, saturating the market right now. Uh, as long as as long as people adopt this new user experience or continue to adopt this new experience of interacting with, or quote unquote, new in that it simulates the the, the sort of typical television experience. But as long as that become continues to take over the the, the market space, I think that that's going to to encourage the growth of, of advertising-based video uh, consumption. Uh, and uh, perhaps that's not necessarily the uh, VOD experience, but bro more broadly, you know, VOD products are, are growing left and right between Peacock and uh, uh, the Roku channels, substantial growth over the past few years. And, and maybe part of that is also these digital linear offerings that are, that are becoming selling points or entry points into the applications. Uh, people, right. people are already paying for, for, for a bunch of services. And, uh, I'm not sure how much, how much additional, uh, breadth people are going to take on with independence. Uh, I think that's, it's one of those things we, 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 we cut the cord and then suddenly there are these things that are being piled, these subscription models are being piled upon us. Um, thanks for that. And then, um, I'm going to start with Casey with this last question because we have run long and I don't want uh, anyone to get bored of looking at, uh, at us. Um, uh, Casey, I'm gonna start with you on this and then gonna go down the line. Uh, what are your predictions for CTV OTT for the next two, three years? And we're gonna re remember this is being recorded. So if you're wrong, we're all gonna look back at this and laugh at you and cookies. Okay. Um, well, in that case, then I'll, I'll weigh my words carefully. I mean, I think that it actually a little bit comes from the, the last question, which is, you know, is AVOD going to take over? Um, to the ultimate panel response, um, it depends on defining takeover. Um, but, you know, I think that when you look at AVOD versus SVOD experiences and what will take place in the future, you know, AVOD 
you're paying with your time. And the Globe has had an unnatural amount of free time uh, for the last year and change. Um, and, you know, now it's going to be competing with like, wow, I can, you know, sit outside somewhere and, you know, just walk around and, you know, chat with people, with strangers. Um, and that's, gonna, that's intense competition. So I actually think that the value of SVOD where particularly you look at things like HBO Max is doing, where they're saying, forget the movie theaters, like watch the stuff in your home. It makes that a very compelling offering because you're both saving time and you're getting, you know, you're, you're basically paying for what would otherwise be a premium experience in your home. So where do I see CTV OTT going? I think long-term it's, it's like the web, um, very fragmented, you know, over time becomes a bit more consolidated, a bit more standardized CPMs come down. There's a kind of few destinations that you hit up uh, a lot of things that people hyped up sort of drift away or become, you know, shells of their former selves. And, you know, the kids go on to something else and we all struggle to understand the appeal of it, but it becomes wildly popular. And I think that that's sort of OTT's future, which is just another media channel amongst film, books, radio, and so on. Right. And if anyone has a child, they know Roblox, um, which is a thing that my eight-year-old seems to not be able to get away from. Um, any, uh, Aaron, Anna, uh, would you like to add on to that? Um, you were going that direction, yeah, Aaron uh, and yours. Anna, please. Uh, first, definitely, I believe that, you know, with the, uh, first of all, the transparency and actually the fraud things can be definitely solved uh, as it, you know, being solved for earlier and the difference. Uh, ecosystems. The second thing is actually that what I see myself and what I what I read a lot is that there are so many uh, channels, uh, uh, specifically SVOD, uh, where you have to pay for so many subscriptions that eventually it's kind of becoming pricey, especially if you count that for, for like, in, you know, for 12 months you have. Uh, it's eventually kind of a big investment. And seeing, you know, different movies and different stuff and different channels uh, gets really, really pricey. So uh, I may assume, I, I believe that the market is going to be uh, going further in terms with uh, how it works on the uh, with ad monetization and with ad supported channels, first of all. And the second, I also believe that, you know, what I'm, you know, bringing up again is the storytelling that, you know, just advertising is going to be advanced and the, the story that advertisers deliver may be even more interesting to the audience so that eventually it is not that disruptive and there's don't look like they're just you know uh, something you try to to avoid by no means but actually sure. uh, you feel comfortable with seeing it because it's you know the best with um, machine learning with artificial intelligence you can have a really aligned strategy and this aligned story here when you see something which actually attracts you and that you feel is comfortable with you enough to to consume it and it's cheaper <laughs> right um great point Aaron. anything you'd like to add there yeah last I week I think that in the um, in the coming years, as uh, the traditional modes of media consumption, cinemas and and uh, cable subscriptions continue to peter out, um, the the OTT market is going to grow. Um, I think we're a ways off from from like the end of, of the limit of that growth. Um, I think the giants like uh, like Netflix, Hulu, uh, and the new new newer giants like HBO Max. Uh, in, in that space are, are going to keep growing and hold strong. But I think there's gonna be more diversity in the, in the non, in the, in the second and below sort of tiers of, of, of the market. And to your point about Roblox, um, th that's a, a clear example of, of a type of media consumption that's uh, very Gen Z <laughs> plus. Right. And a different mode of sort of, uh, media media being shared you know there's so much yeah. like that on social media platforms i think there'll be a continued blurring between what we consider to be ott and what we consider to be uh social media i, I it's just there's so much ad money in social media um at, at present uh and, and i and the um the ot the connected televisions the set top boxes have uh have that technology uh in it and it's, it's gonna be coming increasing competition between people's attention on social media and their attention to, to um, more uh, VOD type 
platforms and of course the digital okay. type platforms. And I think there'll be in that competition somehow will merge those things so much. Um, well, that is, that is all the time we have and all the questions we have. And I wanna thank my panelists for sharing not only this hour, but the pre-call time you guys put into this and all of your expertise and all of your uh, commentary. It's, it's been fantastic and informative and we should open a master class um, of this. That'd be, uh, you guys were extremely impressive. And of course, I wanna thank everyone that joined us, all the attendees that, that, uh, that came and, and, and listened and spent time um, with thought provoking questions. Um, you can hit up all of us individually if uh, you have any further questions about it. I wanna thank this moment in time for giving me an excuse to put on a collared shirt for the first time in a while, um, which is always nice. I've had to figure out how the buttons work. Um, but until the next one, which you will all uh, be alerted of, I wanna thank everyone uh, for spending time with us. And best of luck to you as you guys make your decisions and you move forward into the future. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us today. Bye guys. Yes, thank you.